The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, Chapter 10. Naked Striving and Wishing, Unsatisfied. From the bare inside, something reaches forth. The urging expresses itself first as striving, craving to go anywhere. When the striving is felt, it becomes longing, the only honest state in all men. The longing itself is no less vague and general than the urge, but at least it is clearly directed outwards. It does not burrow like urging does, but roves around, though quite as utterly restless, addicted. And if it becomes obsessed with itself, the longing remains mere general addiction. Roving around blind and empty, the latter can never go to the place where it would be stilled. To achieve... To achieve this, the longing must first clearly drive towards something. As something definite, it ceases to strike out in all directions at once. It becomes a searching that has and does not have what it is searching for. It becomes goal-directed driving. Its driving towards is divided up according to the something at which it is directed. Thus becomes the or that individually nameable drive. This concept, undoubtedly often dulled and reified in a reactionary way, should be understood as meaning the same as need. But since the word need does not also have the resonance of goal-directed driving, the word drive and the concept, understood in an undull way, may be allowed to stand. The drive is also searching to fill a hollow space a missing space in the striving and longing to fill something lacking with an external something. This various something, above all as bread or as woman or as power and so on, in fact divides up the driving towards a goal into its several respective drives. Thus also, when the striving we feel is only general longing, then the felt drive is the particular element of the respective individual passions, emotions. This something enables the drive to decrease when it is satisfied, even to stop temporarily, in contrast to the insatiably continuing addiction. So the goal towards which the drive moves is at the is at the same time that by which, as long as and in so far as it is to hand, it is stilled. The relation of animals to this goal is that of their respective desires. Man also pictures the goal to himself. Thus, man is not only capable of craving, but also of wishing. The latter is more extensive, adds more color than craving. For wishing eagerly looks forward to an imagined idea in which the desire causes what is its own to be pictured. Craving is certainly much older than the imagining of the something which is craved. But precisely because this craving passes over into wishing, it acquires the more or less definite idea of its something, in fact, as a better something. The demand of the wish rises precisely with the idea of the better, even perfect aspect of its fulfilling something so that it may be, may be said, not of course of craving, but of the demand of the wish, wishing arises, if not actually out of imagined ideas, then only together with them. At the same time, it is further stimulated by, by them to the same degree that what is pictured, pictured ahead, promises fulfillment. Thus, where there is the imagined idea of something better, ultimately perhaps perfect, Wishing takes place, possibly impatient, demanding wishing. The mere imagined idea thus becomes a wishful image, stamped with the cachet. This is how it should be. But here wishing, no matter how strong it is, is distinguished from actual wanting by its passive nature, which is still related to longing. In wishing there is not yet any element of work or activity, whereas all wanting is wanting to do. We can wish for the weather to be fine tomorrow, although there is not the slightest thing we can do about it. Wishes can even be entirely irrational. We can wish that X or Y were still alive. It is possibly meaningful to wish this, but meaningless to want it. Therefore, the wish remains even where the will can no longer change anything. The remorseful man wishes that he had not carried out a certain action, but he cannot actually want this. Even despondent, dithering, often disappointed, weak-willed men have wishes, even especially strong wishes, 
without these wishes making them want to do something. Furthermore, different things can be wished. One is spoilt for choice here, but only one of them can be wanted. Whereas the man who wants has already shown preference. He knows what he would rather do. The choice lies behind him. Wishing can be undecided despite the definite imagined goal to which it eagerly looks forward. Conversely, wanting is necessarily active progress towards this goal. It goes outwards, has to measure itself exclusively against things given as real. And the path the wishing takes, wishing augmented and hardened by wanting, can itself be unwished for, that is, rough or bitter. And yet, ultimately, nothing else can be wanted except what is wished. The interested wish is the driving method, drive method, which releases wanting, demonstrates to it what is to be wanted. Hence, though there may be wishing without wanting, namely feeble, inactive wishing, which exhausts itself in the imagination or is impossible, there can be no wanting that is not preceded by wishing. And wanting will be all the stronger, the more vividly the imagined goal which it has in common with wishing has been shaped into a wishful image. Wishes do nothing, but they depict and retain with particular fidelity what must be done. The girl who would like to feel radiant and sought after, the man who dreams of future deeds, where poverty or ordinariness is a temporary skin. This does not cause the skin to be shed, but it does make people grow into it less easily. Bare desire and its drive principally hold on to what they have, but the wishing in them that pictures intends more. It remains unsatisfiable. That is, nothing that exists gives it proper satisfaction. In all of this, drive as definite striving, as a desire for something remains alive.